This episode of The Reality Check is brought to you by HelloFresh. Forget takeout. HelloFresh delivers all the ingredients for delicious, healthy meals anyone can prepare at home in less than 30 minutes. And HelloFresh is giving our Canadian checkers 50% off their first order. Go to HelloFresh.ca and use promo code REALITY50 to get 50% off your first order. That's HelloFresh.ca, promo code REALITY50. This is your reality check. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. This is the show for February 21st, and I'm your host, Darren McKee. With me, as usual, are Adam Gardner. What's up, Cuboids? Christina Roach. Hello. And producer Pat. Hi, everybody. We have a great show for you today. I'm going to talk to you about animals staying warm in the winter and how they do that. And Adam is going to explore the fascinating question of, is dry cleaning dry? But first, Pat, does oil come from dead dinosaurs? Okay, so to start off, I want to play you guys two audio clips of things I've run to in the past month. The first is a clip from the movie Deepwater Horizon. Have you guys seen it? No, but heard of it. I have not even heard of it. It's a dramatization of the April 2010 disaster when an offshore drilling rig exploded, creating the worst oil spill in U.S. history. In this scene, the main character, played by Mark Wahlberg, is listening to his daughter practice for a school presentation about his job. Because that oil is a monster, like the mean old dinosaurs all that oil used to be. So for 300 million years, these old dinosaurs have been getting squeezed tighter, and tighter, tighter, and tighter, because they got miles of earth and ocean pressing down on them. They're trapped, ornery. Then Dad and his friends make a hole in their roof. All those dinosaurs floating into the ocean is tragic. Or fantastic. It's kind of like Jurassic Park. So the second clip I want to play is from a very popular podcast some listeners might be familiar with called Stuff You Should Know. The episode was called, Will We Find Evidence of Aliens by Their Engineering Projects? And on it, they discuss some of the ideas of physicist Freeman Dyson. Well, you know, when you're using energy, most likely you're using something like a fossil fuel, right? Yeah, right. Like gasoline or natural gas or something like that. Stuff that comes from decomposing dinosaurs. Yes. Okay. The problem with using decomposing dinosaurs, as most people know, is that it's essentially a non-renewable resource. There's no more dinosaurs to decompose any longer. And even if there were, it would take tens of millions of years for them to decompose into fossil fuels for us. Mm, stuff you should know is to check your facts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it seems that the idea that fossil fuels come from decomposed dinosaurs is a pretty common one. But yeah. is it true? Way back on episode 94, former TRC host John did a segment on crude oil and abiogenic petroleum origin. This is sort of a catch-all for different hypotheses that propose petroleum and natural gas are formed by inorganic means. For example, it's been proposed that oil and gas originate from deep carbon deposits present since the formation of the Earth. It's also been suggested that hydrocarbons may have arrived on Earth from solid bodies such as comets and asteroids during the late formation of the solar system. Some of these hypotheses gained limited popularity in the past among geologists, particularly in Russia, but they have largely failed to make useful predictions for the discovery of oil deposits. Hmm. There's also the question of biomarker chemicals. Certain chemicals found in naturally occurring petroleum contain chemicals found within many living organisms. Some who support abiogenic hypothesis suggest that this may be the result of oil touching ancient fossils on its way up or bacteria that feeds on hydrocarbons dying in that environment. According to a Live Science article, abiogenic sources of oil have been found but never in commercially profitable amounts. Larry Nation of the American Association of Petroleum Geologists says that the abiogenic versus biogenic controversy isn't about whether naturally forming oil reserves exist, but rather how much they contribute to overall reserves and how much time and effort should be devoted to seeking them out. With that said, most scientists believe that the majority of crude oil is thought to be the transformed remains of long dead organisms. So are we back to dinosaurs? 
Not really. The leading theory is that it comes from the fossils of plants and tiny marine organisms, which predate dinosaurs possibly by millions of years. Hmm. That isn't to say that larger animals didn't contribute to the mix. According to William Thomas, a geologist at the University of Kentucky, quote, I think it would be quite rare and a small and insignificant contribution. So how does this work? Dead organic material accumulates at the bottom of oceans, riverbeds, and swamps, mixing with mud and sand. Over time, more sediment piles on top, and the resulting heat and pressure transforms the organic layer into a dark substance known as kerogen. Left alone, the kerogen molecules eventually crack, breaking up into shorter and lighter molecules, composed almost solely of carbon and hydrogen atoms. Depending on how liquid or gaseous the mixture is, it will turn into either petroleum or natural gas. Scientists aren't totally sure how long the process takes. However, they figure it's probably on the order of hundreds of thousands of years. It's estimated that 95% or more of global oil traces its genesis to the sea. It's the dominant theory, according to David Ross, of Woods Hall Oceanographic Institute on Cape Cod. He suggests that the idea has been largely confirmed, given that geologists have repeatedly found that beds of marine sediment are a good predictor of where to discover oil. Huh. So, why do many people think that crude oil comes from dinosaurs? Well, we sort of used to think that this was true, but even once geologists started to understand better, the idea of oil from dinosaurs continued. Several sources suggest that the Sinclair Oil Corporation may have something to do with this. Hmm, I've never heard this. At the Chicago World Fair of 1933, Sinclair sponsored a dinosaur exhibit. The exhibit included a two-ton animated model of a brontosaurus, what we would now call an apatosaurus. The exhibit proved so popular, it inspired a promotional line of rubber brontosaurus at Sinclair stations, and the inclusion of the brontosaur in their logo. Later, inflatable dinosaurs were given as promotional items, and an anthropomorphic version appeared as a service station attendant in advertisements. Some Sinclair gas stations have full-size models of the mascot straddling the building entrance. Their regular gas is called Dino, and their high-octane fuel blend is called Dino Supreme. At the New York World's Fair of 1964, Sinclair again sponsored a dinosaur exhibit, Dinoland, featuring life-size replicas of nine different dinosaurs, including their signature Brontosaurus. After the fair closed, Dinoland spent a period of time as a traveling exhibit, which was very popular. Is this the um, exhibit that's seen in the movie The Wizard that later became a, um, an intelligent design park? I can honestly say that I don't know the answer to that. Either. All right. Life size, though. That, that's why it would be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. California. Well, so there you have it. Crude oil doesn't come from dead dinosaurs, but Sinclair Oil Corporation may have had something to do with why people still believe it. Man, it doesn't help that Deepwater Horizon and uh, Stuff You Should Know guys cover it, too. I mean, you'd think that a movie that's based in some kind of reality... Coming from the person who did movie myths last week. Wait, let me rethink this. <laughs> <laughs> but you raise a good point. One would hope people would know better. It's also interesting to me that this is a fact that people like. They almost find it interesting. So people like science facts. They just sometimes have the wrong ones. Again, as I say, we kind of used to believe this, and I think it was taught in schools, but it's, it's you know, we've talked about this before. It takes a very long time to get a, a, a wrong idea out of the popular culture. Oh, yeah. Right. Now I'm going to talk to you about how animals stay warm in the winter. Are you like me and when you look at a duck in really cold winter water, you wonder how on earth they aren't freezing? Because you anthropomorphize animals and don't understand things? Well, <laughs> of course we all know that animals have some sort of insulation and ways of coping with the cold winter temperatures, but I thought it worth exploring many of the different ways that they do this. Mental Floss had a great list, which is the source for my segment. You can find that link on our show notes at trcpodcast.com. Great website. But first, let's discuss the main ones that you probably know. Many animals have a layer of fat under their skin, a.k.a. blubber. <laughs> this is both a good insider and can serve as food. Like a blanket you can eat. Yum. 
This is a quote from Scientific American. After the fat layer, many animals have dense underfur or down feathers packed tightly against the skin. Sometimes there is a stationary layer of air to act as an insulator after that. And then finally, there's usually a layer of oily, water-repellent hair or feathers. This keeps moisture out. Supposedly, some polar bears are so well insulated that night vision goggles can't see them because it's not picking up the infrared. Wow. Huh. wow. So you probably knew about fat and water-repellent hair. And for humans, you know we can put more clothing on, we go inside, or we shiver, as do other animals. Mm -hmm. But let's take a look at the interesting range of tactics that different animals use to cope with the cold. One, leaning back. Not a fan of Sheryl Sandberg, obviously. <laughs> this seems pretty simple. If you aren't touching things that are very cold like ice, it's going to be less cold for you. And this is what emperor penguins do. They often lean back onto their heels and get their toes off the ice. They rest upon their tails for stability, and it helps because of the shape lets them sort of lean back on it. And since blood doesn't flow through their tail feathers, this doesn't cause heat loss. Next, there is the group huddle. This is another tactic emperor penguins used, and that's where they move together in unison, standing very close together, and they rotate time on the inside and time on the outside of the huddle. That's that's there's, fair. there's warmth in a crowd. Mm. This is from Mental Floss. Research has also shown that the penguins are not crammed together, but instead stand barely touching so that no penguin's feathers get compressed. Ah. I thought they were all huddled in literally close together. Because the feathers, they create a, an insulation as well, and they don't want to compromise mm -hmm. them. Hmm. Then there is increasing blood glucose levels. So to reduce the likelihood of ice crystals forming and puncturing their blood vessels, some reptiles and amphibians have the ability to increase their glucose levels during the colder months. Wow. Good for them. Next, something very relaxing, which is hanging out in a hot spring. Okay. Now, you've probably seen photos of the Japanese macaques hanging out in these hot springs. In Japan, they are called onsens, and the monkeys love relaxing in the warmth. Why not if it's right there, right? What kind of monkey doesn't like it? Mm -hmm. Another one, which is pretty interesting, is making antifreeze. This is a quote from Mental Floss. Scientists have found that Alaskan wood frogs and other species take hibernation one step further. Their bodies freeze during the winter. Glucose in the blood prevents their cells from freezing and prevents dehydration, but all bodily processes, including the heart and brain function, stop during this time. According to scientists, the frogs are essentially dead until spring comes, temperatures rise, and the frogs begin to spring to life again. So could you freeze a frog for like 100 years and then just bring him back to life? Excellent question, Adam. Possibly. I believe there's a transhumanist frog meetup that we can check that out on the weekend. Ooh, fun. <laughs> There's uh, another tactic that animals might use is building snow bunkers. Similar to igloos, some animals hide in compressed snow. Mental Floss says that lemmings and other small animals build tunnel systems to stay safe from the wind, cold, and predators. Cool. They actually get a layer of warmth in there by compressing it. Another interesting tactic is to shut down your lungs. Why not? Not fully in a coma, but close to it, freshwater turtles slow their metabolisms and self-anesthetize. In this way, they shut down organs until the weather warms up. Man, <laughs> some of these seem like pretty enviable. Yeah. This one I thought was pretty interesting. Just keep flying. A study found that alpine swift birds are able to stay in the air for six months at a time oh, without smokes. touching the ground, subsisting on aerial plankton, a mix of small insects, bacteria, and spores found in the air, and foregoing sleep. Scientists are divided as to whether the birds skip sleep completely or catch some shut-eye during short periods of spent gliding rather than flapping. By the time the birds return to their starting location, they have six months to rest and refuel before they start their journey again. I just like the idea, like, I'm a bit tired. I'll just sleep while I'm gliding down <laughs> in the air. Oh, I'll wake up again. Next, there is deep sleep. You know that some animals hibernate, but North American black bears have a unique ability. They can slow their metabolism without a large drop in temperature. As I mentioned, some of the other animals are actually freezing, but they can actually do it without dropping too much temperature. Second last, stealing heat from others. In a process called kleptothermy, you can probably piece together what that means, reptiles like the tutara steal the body heat of animals from completely different species. They might enter birds' nests at night, not for food, but to absorb the higher body temperature of the birds. Cool. Imagine you're like, are you going to eat me? No. I just want your heat. <laughs> just exist. <laughs> I, I really did just want to cuddle. Yeah, exactly. And finally, some animals, well, they rely on humans. Much like humans go indoors, smaller animals might try to hide out in a human's home. Uh, yeah. And we also know... This is for Adam. The cats love the warmth of cars. So be careful when you're starting your car. Is that a real thing? It just Well, that's a, it could be a future I segment for another show. I, I, I've like, every time I see that, I'm like, I should look at that for the show, whether or not you have to bang on your hood to scare out cats or whatever. Well, they're not using the driver's seat. That's, that seems unlikely. Yeah. I, I've seen cats in wheel wells and stuff like that. So. Yeah. 
even just behind one of the wheels or under the car, mm-hmm. uh, creating some warmth and insulation. So there's a huge list of different ways that animals cope with the winter weather. I certainly thought flying for six months of the year and living on air food uh, was the most interesting. <laughs> I use um, a combination of just, just, just a hatred and spite for winter, which warms me up inside and alcohol. <laughs> it's not true. I don't really drink. <laughs> That's not true. I don't really drink. I just have the hate and the spite. That was cute. Adam, you have such a dry wit. If only it could be clean somehow. Is dry cleaning really dry? <laughs> what 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 does the name dry cleaning even mean? So first, I want everyone to contemplate what dry cleaning is. For the panel, how do you think dry cleaning works? Darren, I'll start with you. I can only think of the Seinfeld bit, where he talks about blowing on something or scratching it. That's it. That's all you have in terms of dry cleaning. I, I really hope there's some sort of technique, which is just superior, which uses different types of solvents or goods. But I still think there's liquid involved. All right. Pat and Christina? I believe that dry cleaning involves some sort of solvent, mm-hmm. which would kind of defeat the purpose of calling it dry. But it... My understanding is there's no water used, but some kind of solvent is used to to uh, clean the clothes. All right. Pat, what do you think? So during the late 90s, I played in a band that rehearsed in the basement of a dry cleaner. Oh. So I actually know the answer to this because I was interested and in one time asked the guy who was running the place. Oh, excellent. So when I was younger, I thought that maybe the clothes were steamed with something or maybe exposed to a kind of gas. There's this dry cleaning place near my house. And the dry cleaning came out on this sort of rail where all the clothes were hanging on it. And they seemed to be pushed out from kind of a back room. And I imagine that the clothes traveled along this rail, went through a series of fancy machines, not on like a car wash and got cleaned. And I pictured gas and all kinds of cool stuff. As I got older, I was led to believe that there were perhaps still liquids involved, but that they weren't water. So I thought maybe it was sprayed with sort of alcohol, which would evaporate and not really get it wet. Um, in short, I really didn't know, so I sought to understand whether dry cleaning was really as dry as the name says. I suppose this question can be answered depending on your definition of dry, or inversely, your definition of wet. Some definitions have dry or wet referring simply to the presence or absence of water. Others will use the term to mean the presence or absence of liquid. Dry cleaning uses liquid, but it doesn't use water. The conventional way to clean clothes employs water mixed with soap and alkali. The soap and alkali in the water will dislodge oil and fat and make them soluble, which allows them to wash away with water. Water is a polar solvent which binds to polar groups in some fabrics. This can cause swelling and stretching of proteins within the fibers. The water can also interfere with weak attractions within the fiber, which can warp their shape The fiber generally regains its original shape when the water dries off, but the fabric remains a bit distorted, hence issues such as shrinkage. Some fabrics are more prone to this than others, sort of depending on the polar groups within that fabric. So what is going on with dry cleaning? What's the difference? In short, the clothes are cleaned in a waterless, room temperature liquid. As the story goes, Jean-Baptiste Jolly noticed that when a kerosene lamp spilled onto a tablecloth, it removed some stains. Now, I don't know how true that story is. It's kind of like Newton's apple, but that is what people say. Early dry cleaning, starting around 1855, was done using petroleum-based solvents. These had a tendency to catch fire and explode, so these were replaced with chlorinated solvents such as tetrachloroethylene. These are non-polar solvents. Basically, this means that unlike water, they won't warp the fabric. These solvents will dissolve non-polar stains, which would not normally dissolve in water. So dry cleaning not only is better for certain fabrics, but is better for certain kinds of stains. These don't require a high temperature and tumbling, so it's safer on more delicate fabrics. The machine works a lot like a conventional washing machine with a drum or basket which stores the clothes. It rotates in a chamber that is about one-third filled with the solvent of choice, which is then filtered and repeatedly passed through the cage. The solvent is then reclaimed for future use, with modern machines recovering some 99.99% of the liquid. So this is done through centrifugal force by spinning the basket at great speeds. The clothes are then dried by being tumbled in warm air, nothing too hot like a normal conventional dryer. 
So, historically, a lot of cheap solvent was vented into the atmosphere, but these days vapors are condensed and then returned to the solvent tank, which causes very little air pollution. So there's been a lot of different solvents throughout the years, and there's some newer ones that are used these days, but that is basically the process um, with different solvents. So, is that wet or dry? Well, it depends what you mean by the terms wet and dry. Dry cleaning is water-free, but not liquid-free. If you're like me, however... Just don't buy dry clean only clothes. You're never going to wash them. <laughs> You'll never go take them to be dry clean. <laughs> yes. You'll oh, like, dry clean only. Let's see how it goes. Exactly. In the let's see how this goes. <laughs> I'll just let it air dry. Air dry clean. Yeah. Thanks, Adam, for validating my belief, which is what we all want. Like. <laughs> and thanks for joining us once again. Pat showed us that oil doesn't come from dead dinosaurs. I told you about the numerous ways that animals cope with the winter cold. Some of them you might be able to use for yourself. And Adam explored the fact of dry cleaning isn't dry as you might think it is because there's still some liquid, but it's not water. And just before we go, we wanted to touch on a couple of housekeeping items. I'm actually going to go on vacation for the next couple of weeks. If you happen to live in San Jose, Costa Rica, send me a message. Maybe we'll hang out. But in lieu of that, we're going to air a couple shows for you. One is going to be the remains of the Exposing Pseudo-Astronomy crossover show we did with Stuart Robbins. And after that, we're going to have a little interview with Jim Davies. The other thing I wanted to mention was that last week I got really busy and I cut a couple of corners on my normal workflow for editing the show. That resulted in two edits being missed. Um, I caught them after the fact and uploaded a new file, but many people had already downloaded the podcast. One of these edits was particularly funny because it was a soundbite meant to demonstrate that a gun fired with a silencer <laughs> was actually still quite loud. And instead, some of you heard silence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So thanks to those of you who wrote in and pointed the mistake out. Uh, know that I didn't feel good when I discovered it, and I'm sorry. I will strive to do better in the future. I think the exact term was, I feel sick to my stomach. Yep, I my had to talk him down. Yep. And you listeners are getting a glimpse into Pat's perfectionism, which is why the show sounds so good in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> You I guys wouldn't almost... have noticed that 300 episodes ago. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I can pretty much assure you that it will never happen again. <laughs> well, Pat, we appreciate all your efforts all the time. Absolutely. And until next time, listeners, think better to act better. Peace out, Cuboids. Stay classy, not smart assy. Good night, everyone. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast. I'm going to say by genetic a million times. Did I say genetic? You said it right. You said okay. genetic. If you want to know more about abiogenetic, I'm going to do it a million times. Abiogenetic. Is it it's just abiogenic? Yes. Abiogenic. I, I did it right. Abiogenetic. Abiogenetic. Abiogenic. Abiogenetic. <laughs> Just a second. Abiogenic. <laughs> okay. This rivals syllogism. <laughs> no, this is Vince Surf territory. <laughs>